Listening to all of you, we are really happy to have Munish here as we've shared his annual report with all of you this morning. You know, this, what you can see on the screen is the letter that Warren Buffett had written to him. It's a very unique thing about what he's achieved in what he does at Dakshana Foundation. I mean, I'm just assuming that all you guys are from the field of investing, so I don't want to talk too much about all his achievements on the markets, whether in India or in the US. Ever since he had that lunch with Warren Buffett, he's become famous and all of us know a lot about what he does and what he says. However, things that I think are not known about Monish and his achievement, like I was just mentioning to him, and when, we, when I was trying to get him here, he said that he comes here once in a year to the Dakshana Valley. Now, for all of you who don't know about Dakshana Valley, I will say that it is a must-go place. It's just two hours from here. It's a phenomenal achievement of what they do there. Two of his colleagues are here, right in front of us, who are on a day-to-day -day basis running the place. And Monish has the ability to delegate and monitor so well that if you read the annual report, which I have emailed to all of you this morning, you'll see the achievement. I think the, you know, we always say that we can blame the government of India for the PSUs and the ROC and all of that, but the best ROC they've got is from IITs and IIMs. I think even Monish's performance on Dakshana is far better than anything he does in the markets. I would say that any of you who have not read the report should read it. And all of you who can take the opportunity to visit the place, it is a phenomenal place. And I think it is one of the best institutions that are run for education for the underprivileged in India. So with that, I would now talk about his achievements in India and in the markets. When he talks about certain companies, I'm quite surprised at the depth of his knowledge about Indian companies. And when you see the YouTube videos and he shows you around his office and all of that, you wonder how does he find time to manage all the things that he does. He's promised us today that he's making a presentation on something that he's not talked about before. So I don't want to keep you all waiting from <laughs> that presentation and we'd like to leave as much time for question and answers about what he's presenting about Dakshana, about Indian markets, about US markets, about China, and most importantly, about Charlie Munger, his friend whom I believe he plays, he used to play bridge with. Thank you, Monish. Thanks again for being here. And Thank you, Durgesh Bhai. Actually, Durgesh Bhai has been a great supporter of Dakshana for many years. One of his classmates used to be our chief operating officer. Sharmila and you went to college together, I think. Good to have that connection. But he'd been telling me for many years to come to Flame, and I hardly make it to Pune. I was trying to do that, and I, I didn't think it would work come here on December 25th. But he said, yeah, no, it, it would work. So I said, okay, that's, that works, works well. We were able to do that. And I had a wonderful tour of the campus that I'm sure all of you have had. And this is a surreal place. Hard to believe that a place like this exists. True labor of love. I think it's amazing. It's really quite unbelievable to see something like this come alive and to come alive in the manner that it's exactly what the vision was, maybe even better than what the vision was. So it's great to see that. I have a few slides I'll go through. I'm more interested in hearing what you guys have on, in your mind. So we don't need to talk about what's in the slides. We can talk about whatever you'd like to talk about. So that's perfectly fine. I'll go through the go through the slides and then we'll kind of see where the evening takes us. So thank you. I thought I'd basically talk about two different companies. And maybe that would, might serve as a backdrop. They're both great companies, truly really exceptional businesses, actually. And one is based in India, Varun Beverages, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. 
and the other one, uh, Coca-Cola Isaac, is based in Turkey, but they do bottling in about a, about a dozen countries. I was taking a look at Varun Beverages and basically looking at some of the, the numbers and so on, you know, about two billion US dollars in revenue and about 250 million or so in net income, 16 billion or so market cap. And, you know, I always like to think, okay, so what does this business look like, like 10, 15 years from now? What might be the future of Varun? India has incredible tailwinds. It has one of the best demographic stories anywhere in the world. You know, we've got uh, one of the rare large company countries in the world with a growing population. It's expected to be about 1.6 billion in 2038. Per capita income is almost a 3x, is what they're projecting. I, I think the 7,200 per capita in 2038, I don't think that's etched in stone. You know, and I think that if that actually happens, this country will look quite different, look amazingly different than the way we see it today. So that would be quite a welcome change. And so if we look at Varun, you know, they have about 900 million cases. Cases are, you know, 24 units of eight ounces each. And their recent volume growth has been about like 15% annually. And I just kind of, took a stab, I said, okay, so let's say they grow 15% a year for the next five years. Then it grows a little slower, maybe 10%, and then maybe 8% thereafter. And what would the business look like? And one of the things about the bottling business is that we have a lot of comps all over the world. There's a number of bottlers that are publicly traded all over the world. They bottle for Coke or Pepsi. The arrangements are very similar. And there are commonalities amongst them, even though the geographies are different, even though some things are different. So you can actually do some comparisons across different bottlers. And if those were the growth numbers, basically you would have about five times the volume that you have today. And you'd have about a one and a quarter billion of after-tax earnings growing at about 8% 8 maybe you'd give it a 15, 20 multiple. 19 to 25 billion market cap. And compared to the 15 or 16 billion today, it'd be about 1.3 to 3.2% 3 .2 annualized plus dividends. So there's a question that comes up, which is that why couldn't volumes grow faster? You know, why would they slow down? So why, why can't volumes keep growing at 15% a year? So 15% volume growth with a 7% GDP growth and 0.65% population growth endlessly is not possible. You know, they would just, it would just defy reality. But even if you assume that kind of a situation, you end up with about a 2 billion PAT and 50, 60 billion market cap, from 8 to 9% annually plus dividends. But this 15%, we can kind of use Munger inversion to see how realistic it is. So if you, you know, the NARTD is the non-alcoholic ready to drink kind of acronym. So basically, if, if volumes grew 15% a year, we would be at about 700 servings per year per capita in India. What that would mean is that every person is having two Pepsi products every day. And so if Pepsi had like 50% market share, then the country is having like four kind of products every day. And the 700 servings per year, we do have, we do have comparisons around the world with that, with that particular metric. And so if you look at the per capita servings in number of different geographies. The United States is the, the highest, about 1,400 servings per capita. And, and if, if, you, if you look at a country like, let's say, Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia is about 885, and the UK is about close to 700. And 
basically Saudi per capita GDP today is about 32,000 versus what India would have, which would be about 7,200. So we would have like a four to one delta, and it's a hotter country. So hotness has correlation with consumption of coke. Even if you compare with China, you know, China's per capita GDP today is about 12,500, which would be almost double, maybe 80% more, and they are at about 337. So the 700 servings per day just for Varun seems quite unbelievable to make that assumption. And then we have Coca-Cola ISEC. So it's a bottler based in Istanbul. They have exclusive bottling rights to all Coke products in Turkey, Pakistan, Kazakhstan, Iran, Iran, not Iran, Iraq, Uzbekistan, various other stans. And they are rumored to be getting Bangladesh. Coke has got a few problem countries where they want to change the bottler. India is one of those problem countries. So Coke wants to change the bottler in India, the bottler, the different bottlers they have. They want to change it in Vietnam and they want to change it in Bangladesh. It's rumored because they put out a press release that basically there were rumors in the market that they might be getting Bangladesh. And they just said that we have discussions going on with the Coca-Cola company in Bangladesh. And Bangladesh is about 600 million cases a year. Varun, I just said, is about, about 900. And Coca-Cola, I said, across the other geographies is about 1.6 billion cases. So it's about twice the size of Varun. So if we look at Coca-Cola ISEC, we have about 4 billion of revenue, about 400 million net income, about a 3.7 billion market cap. P ratio is under 10. They're growing at about like 6 to 9%. Plus they may get Bangladesh. And uh, it's possible at some point they might get some part of India and so on. We'll, we'll have to see. And Varun is approximately half that size, little more than half the income, significantly higher trailing multiple, and currently a higher growth rate. But Coca-Cola ISEC actually is, it's a listed company. It's 50% owned by Anadolu FS. So the family that owns the bottling business owns half of Anadolu FS, 50%. So there are two listed companies in Turkey. One of them is Anadolu FS, and Anadolu FS itself owns 50% of the Coke bottler. So if you think about the structure, basically, it's not exactly a holding company because it's actually got operations. So the family that owns it, actually their entire shareholding of Coca-Cola ISEC is sitting in Anadolu FS. The Anadolu FS beer business has a normalized market cap, I'm mean, not a normalized earnings of, on the beer side of about 200 million. But recently there was a transaction that took place. So Anadolu FS is the number one beer brand in Russia, for example. They have a number of countries. In fact, they're number one in Turkey also, but their biggest business is in Russia. In Russia, their joint venture partner is the Anheuser-Busch people, 3G Capital, all of them, all those guys. And all these American companies are divesting the Russian assets. So Heineken sold their Russian business for one dollar. And basically, another Am Imbev doesn't want to sell the Russian business, but they have to. So they recently, this has been going on for about a year and a half with, when I met the company, they would say, yeah, we are negotiating with them, we're trying to figure out what works. The family that owns Anadolu FS and Coca-Cola ISEC is one of the probably the highest reputed families in Turkey from a governance point of view, reputation point of view. 
So the partners they have in their different businesses are truly world-class partners. And so, for example, the family also has all the McDonald's franchises in Turkey. It's a private, they've not listed that, they just, they just own that. And Coke in Atlanta owns 20% of Coke ISEC, and they sit on the board. And Amimweb owns 20% of FS, and they sit on the board. So they just announced recently that Amimweb decided to sell the 50% of the business that they did not own to FS. And they did not really discuss a lot of things about the deal. What they said is, FS is paying nothing to Amimweb, zero. And over the next few years, based on earnings, there will be some payments. So one of the things you've got to understand is a seller agreed to sell with nothing down. And that's part of the reason that, the, because the reputation of the family is so strong, that the seller is not going to have any concerns, okay, I won't get my money, or what might happen in the future, any of that. They have no concerns about that. And the FS, in their negotiations, would not have squeezed Amimba because they want a 50-year relationship, 100-year relationship with them. So it's a good symbiotic thing. But basically, bottom line is that in that press release, the Amimba people said that we think our business is, our 50% of the business is worth about 1.3 billion. And they didn't really say anything else beyond that, that implying that maybe they'll get maybe 1.3 billion over a few years or something. So FS market cap is two and a half billion. And so they now have 100% of the beer business, which should be worth at least two and a half billion, just the, just the Russia beer business. They also have Ukraine, which is about one fourth the size of Russia. They shut down the operations there. So at some point if the war ends, they, they had closed all their breweries, but they just opened one or two of their breweries now recently looked at the areas where they were safe to open and they've, they have number one market share in Ukraine as well, so they've started producing there and they've got a few other countries. And so if you look at the FS beer business to get, in total, it's 34 million hectoliters. And just to give you a context, India's entire beer market is 65 million hectoliters. So FS's beer business is more than 50% of all of India. And UB, which is much smaller than FS in volumes, has a five and a half billion market cap. You know, so, and so FS by itself has a lot of value, but inside FS is 50% of the Coke bottle. And I own shares in FS, and I own shares in Coke, and I don't own shares in Varun, just as a disclosure. Like I said, the market cap about two and a half billion, Coca-Cola insect market cap under four billion, and Tom Gaynor is a good friend of mine. Some of you might have heard of Tom Gaynor, the CEO of Markel Insurance. And Tom Gaynor is on the board of Coke in Atlanta. And I saw a Facebook post by Tom. Tom is very active on Facebook, where he was posting some pictures of him in Istanbul. So Tom does not venture about outside the US. He's very meat and potatoes American guy. So I asked Tom, Istanbul mein kya kar rahe ho? So he said, we have a Coke board meeting in Istanbul. So I had to come to Istanbul. I understood that since Tom never leaves the US, he can only leave for these reasons. And he explained to me that basically Coke has four board meetings a year. Two of those meeting meetings take place in Atlanta, where there's Coke, Coke is headquartered. And the other two meetings, one takes place in New York every year, and the fourth one rotates. It goes in a different geography in the world. They just want to expose the Coke board members to Coke in different countries. So they have one meeting a year. So this year, it happened to be in Istanbul. And he was telling me, Obviously, he cannot tell me anything about what is going on in the board meetings and all of that, you know, so. But he was telling me that he, they had a presentation in Istanbul, which was made by the CEO of Coca-Cola Isaac. 
to the Koch board. And he said that that presentation blew him away. He said, he just, he thought, okay, some bottler CEO is making some presentation to the board, whatever. But he said, once the guy started talking, he was totally captivated. So Coca-Cola Isaac has had hired a new guy as a CEO. He relocated from Chicago to Istanbul. He's half Turkish. I met him in March. I, I met the Coke people, Coca-Cola Isaac people for a few years. But this year when I went in, in March, I met him and he blew me away. I mean, like literally I was just floored when I saw this guy. And one of the things that was very impressive to me was that the family was even able to attract some guy like that. So it's hard to explain all the different nuances about this guy. But basically I came to the conclusion that whatever was happening with the Coca-Cola Isaac business before this guy came and what would happen after he came will be very different. One thing about the Coca-Cola business or the Pepsi business is that it's, it's about close to 150 years old, 140 years old, and it's an embryonic business. So we think of Coke as a mature business. You know, after 140 years, things get matured. But it's not, actually there are two, three things about Coke that I've tried to learn and understand over the years. And I was telling Tom, I was talking to him, I said, Tom, I don't have any desire to serve on any boards. You know, I'm not a board guy, you know. But I said, if they ever call me to serve on the Coke board, that would be a board I would love to be on. To be able to see what's happening from that vantage point would be just unbelievable. Basically, you know, we think of Coke as a 140-year-old company. We think of it as a mature company. And we think that basically everything about it is pretty well known and well understood and all of that. But that's not the case. It's actually a very, actually, when you go into the details, it's a very complex business. It appears to be simple. It's a very simple business to understand. But when you get into the different weeds about brands, market share, growth, how much you spend on marketing and different things, it starts to get complicated. And also, you have so many different variables that you can play with. So the Coke CEO so told me when I met him last time, he said, listen, I don't want to meet you in the office next time. Office mein kuch nahi hota. He said, next time, let's meet in the market. And he said, let's meet in the market in Eastern Turkey. So basically, if you think about Turkey, Istanbul, Western Turkey, that would be like New York. You know, go to Eastern Turkey, that would be more like Iraq. You know, so there's a big difference. Even though Turkey is one market, just in that market, there's a lot of uh, differences in the different uh, situations. And just to give you a little bit of a flavor for how Coke works is they had a bottler in Uzbekistan. And they had a joint venture with the bottler. So 50% of that bottler was owned by the Coca-Cola company. And 50% was owned by actually the Uzbek government. So government is their partner there, and it comes from Soviet times. So Uzbekistan used to be part of the Soviet Union, and this bottler was part of that whole Soviet apparatus. So their whole way of running that business was the way the Soviet Union ran. So they are only bottling three products of Coke. No, Coke has hundreds of products. They're only bottling three products. They don't have any trucks. So if you want Coke or Coke products in Uzbekistan, you show up at the factory gate, you pay cash, and you take the Coke. And needless to say, the Coca-Cola company was pissed off, quite pissed off with the Uzbekistan situation. And they kept trying to get them to sell the steak, try to get another bottler there, something, and they were not interested. So finally, one day, the Uzbek government wakes up and tells Coke, we have decided to divest our stake. And Coke is thinking, there is a god, you know. <laughs> but they said, we don't have an interest in selling it to you. We want to sell it to the highest bidder. 
So Coke said, look, we have partnerships with our bottlers. We don't want some random third party coming in. They said, no, no. We are just concerned about the Uzbek citizens. We want the highest price for our citizens. And we will give it to the highest bidder. What happens after that is your business. So Coke went to Coca-Cola Isaac and said, no matter what the price you have to pay, buy the business. So Isaac said that when you say no matter what the price, we have a business to run. You know, we can't just pay any price. They said, no, we own 50%. We will sell our 50% to you at a very discounted price. So the overall price will look OK to you. Just make sure you are the highest bidder and you take it. And they went to ISEC because it's a trusted entity, right? I mean, they've had a long history. So when the deal finally took place, I think that the Uzbek side was bought at equivalent value of 430 million. And then Coke sold their part of it to them at 230 million. So blended like maybe 300 odd million they paid for something like net income of around 15 million, about a 20 multiple. It was not growing, it was a flat business. So the analysts were really upset at Google Isaac K, what are you doing? This is a ridiculous multiple. Even with the Coke discount, it's very high. The first year that they ran the business, the net income was 80 million. So I asked them, how did it go from 15 million to 80 million? They said, we bought some trucks. We painted those trucks red. We put our logo on the trucks. We drove into the town and we just shook everyone's hand. And when we shook their hand, we put one cooler in their shop. That's all we did. We have not increased the range of products. We haven't done anything else yet. Abhi baki karenge. So you look at a place like Uzbekistan, and actually the Coke business there is embryonic. You know? So there's a lot of places like that where you have this weirdness going on. So it's kind of a fun company to study. And all three of these businesses, they have great managements, great value, great uh, brands, and terrific businesses. So this is a chart which shows kind of trailing PEs of different countries. Ek taraf India hai, like more than 25 times earnings. And on the extreme other end of the curve is Turkey at seven times. And I, I started making trips to Turkey about five years ago. I have a friend in Istanbul who is a hardcore Ben Graham disciple, comes to the Berkshire meetings, very nice guy. I'm trying to make him a Munger disciple. So I'm trying to convert him from Ben Graham to Charlie Munger. Thoda progress hua hai, lekin jada progress nahi hua hai. I will explain to you the progress I'm making with him. So I told Haider that, listen, I want to come to Istanbul. I would like to meet the companies that are in your portfolio. But I don't want to meet companies that you don't have money currently invested in. Don't take me to meet some random company that this is a great company or that's a great company. If it's not in your portfolio, don't take me there. And I said, let's start with the first company being the one that you have the highest position in. And then we'll take the second one, third one, fourth one. I went in, first trip was 2018. And the first company he was taking me to. So I had not really, he had sent me information, these are the businesses, whatever. I hadn't really looked into a lot of these things. I said, let me meet these companies, then I'll do some work on them, you know, sort of trying to do the work in advance. I'm too lazy for that. So when we were driving to the first company, which was a bank, I said, this bank is your biggest holding. He said, yeah, this is my biggest holding. So I said, why do you like it? He said the PE is 0.1. So, abhi, you know, PE humne digits mein suna hai. You know, decimals mein nahi suna hai. You know, 0.1. So I said 0.1 means ha, one month's earnings. The whole market cap is equal to one month's earnings. So I said, fraud hai kya? You know, like what's going on here? He said, no, no, it's a, it's a perfectly 
normal bank, but they have some hair. There's some hair on it. I said, before we go into meeting, can you tell me about the hair? Like, what is, what is causing this? Because now I'm like wide awake. You know, PE of point 0.1, like we're ready to go. And so it's one of the largest banks in Turkey. And so he says that basically there are these UN sanctions where cannot do wire transfers and different things with Iran. There's a lot of restrictions in, in that. And the chairman of the bank was routinely doing all kinds of transactions back and forth. And the US got wind of that. So the CFO of the bank had gone to the US with his family for a vacation in Disneyland. So he landed in New York. And when he landed in New York, the feds picked him up and they put him in Rikers prison. OK, locked up. And then this was like, you know, like at that time, Trump was the president. Erdogan is calling Trump saying, please release this guy. He's not really involved in all this. It was the chairman and all that. This guy is a normal guy. So Trump said, you know, I, let me explain something to you. US president has no powers, OK? He so said, this state of New York has acted on this thing. I have no control over the state of New York. If I call them because they're all Democrats, they will make sure he will never leave the prison. <laughs> so he told Erdogan, I, there's nothing I can do. I'm sorry. I would like to help you, but I can't do anything. So then Haider tells me, so this is the situation right now. So I told Haider, OK, so we went to the meeting. I met them all, perfectly honorable people, good bank, prudent lending and everything. We came out, and I said, this is too much for me to handle. I can't do such kind of investments. Let's go to at least P of two or three, <laughs> so we can see something more normal. He said, no problem. Turkey, we have everything. For you. Full range of things that you want to look at is, is available. So the following year in 2019, so I visited, I think, on that trip, I must have visited like 15 businesses. And then it was so much fun because, you know, in the evenings, there were blue fish on the Bosphorus River, nicely grilled, olive oil, just great weather, great everything. So next year, I said, OK, Haider, I'm coming again. Let's look at some more businesses. He said, oh, this is a lot of fun. So he was driving me to one of the, one, another company. And I said, tell me about this company. He said, the company, this company has a market cap of $16 million, one six. And liquidation value is $800 million. So I said, fraud hai kya? He said, no, no, I am invested in this company. So I said, what do they do? He says, it's a very simple business. They have warehouses. They are the number one warehouse operator in Turkey. And they have 12 million square feet of warehouses, 99% lease, 10-year leases, inflation indexed, or they are Euro leases. Amazon, IKEA, Carrefour, Mercedes, Toyota, these are all the tenants. So it's all like AAA rated tenants. So I said, why is the stock sitting where it's sitting? He said, it's Turkey, just the way it is. He said, everything is cheap. I said, yeah, but this is like beyond cheap, you know? <laughs> so I met the father and son who own and run the business. I found them really smart, good guys. Then I went and visited at least the Istanbul warehouses. They have about 70 warehouses. I think I went by maybe 20 of them. It looked, I mean, everything looked great to me. And basically, it was like, it was really simple because those warehouses have a value. Any realtor will tell you what they are worth. So warehouses, when you add it up, it was about a billion dollars. And there was about 200 million of debt. There was the 16 million market cap. And one of the things that was happening at that time is that Turkey, even then and today, though it's improved now, is the currency is very unstable very high inflation rate. And all the foreign investors were exiting. So I thought 16 million market cap, who knows what you can get, what liquidity there is, what is there. But I tried to buy the stock. And I found that there is tremendous liquidity. 
and for $8 million, I got one third of the company. And basically, there's a company I met in Turkey, which is like kind of like Tata. The CFO was talking to me. He said, you know, I want to explain Turkey to you. You don't understand Turkey. Let me explain Turkey. I said, yeah, please. I'm Forrest Gump. You can explain it to me. No problem. So he said, you know, every country has a national game, a national sport, a national game. Like he said, in the US, it is poker. In China, it is bakara. Russia, it is chess. He said, do you know what the national game in Turkey is? I said, no, I don't know what the national game in Turkey is. He says, it's backgammon. So Turkey has all these different kind of little backgammon rooms. These men come and play there. So he said, look, if you look at poker, it's a mix of skill and luck. If you look at chess, it's all skill. You look at uh, Bakara, all luck. And he said backgammon is pure gambling. There is no skill. It's all, all, all luck based. So he said Turks are addicted to backgammon. And the way they treat the stock market is the way they treat the game of backgammon. So Turkey is an unusual place in the sense that if you take out what the foreign invest investors own and you take out what the promoters own, the float after you take these two entities out, for most companies, the average time to cycle through the entire float is nine trading days. So when I told my Turkish friend that this guy is saying it's nine trading days, he said, I'm surprised it is nine days. He said, the normal modus operandi for all the Turks is they want to invest at 10 o'clock. They want to close the position at 3 o'clock. And they want to make 10%. And that's their model. And make 10% and again go next day, make another 10%. And good luck with that. You know. And so when I was buying this stock, I'm seeing massive volumes of brokers offering. He's saying 1 million shares, 5 million shares. And I said, OK, yeah, take. Keep taking, no problem, you know, it's the people are willing to give it to me. And then there's a block that came, which was a 5% block. And the broker said, look, the rumor is that Templeton Funds is selling. I just want to let you know that there's a good fund in New York that is selling, just in case, you know, you want to rethink whether you want to buy. I said, please take the, take the million, 5% position. So some guy in New York at Templeton issued an order, exit Turkey didn't care what they own, right? So Resas was a holding. Some poor Templeton analyst did some research on this company, bought the stock. His boss and boss's boss overruled him. And it ends up with the Indian guy. No problem. <laughs> so very quickly, I own one third of the company. Now, you fast forward four years. When I was buying the stock, the Turkish lira was five lira to the dollar. It is now 29 lira to the dollar. The lira is collapsed. In dollars, our market cap has gone from 16 million to 500 million in the last four years. But those guys are extremely good operators. The business is probably worth at least a billion and a half. It may be worth more. I mean, I think my billion and a half number is at least six or eight months old. It may be worth more now. It might be by a few months, it might be two billion. We'll see. You know, I mean, the way I look at it is that we just have to sit there. And then, you know, my friend Haider, who took me to this, this company, he owned the shares. When the market cap hit 40 million, he told me he has completely sold the shares. So I said, Haider, you told me the liquidation value is 800 million. He said, yes. I'm a one-bagger guy. He said, I have a simple rule. Anything doubles, I sell it. So, that, at that point, I understood that a major intervention is needed. You know, just talking is not enough. So I sent him a bust of Charlie Munger with my compliments for free. I said, road subha thora aarti karo. <laughs> Before you start your work, just go to the bust. Learn, say, two, three Munger quotes, then go sit in your chair. He said, I'll do that. And I talked to him. He has made some progress, but it will take some time. I don't think I've got him out of the... So I told, I told Haider, listen, I visited with you about 
60 Turkish companies so far. And what I decided in Turkey was that in all other markets, I have to make a compromise. Like in India, for example, if I look at a truly great business with truly exceptional management, with great corporate governance, the PE for sure will be nosebleed. You know, if I get all those three things, I have to pay a lot, right? And if I want to pay, and I'm just telling you from an outsider, you guys have far more experience here. If I want to pay something resembling a normal multiple, then I have to compromise. I have to compromise either on business quality or management quality or governance quality. Something or the other I have to kind of play with to try to make the numbers work, right? But in Turkey, because there's all this madness going on, I said, I'm just going to do one very simple filter, which is the highest quality business and the highest quality management. Whatever the price is, I'll buy it. Because sab kuch sale pe hai. So I don't need to go, and I tried to tell Haider this. I said, look, Haider, if you see a business of PE of three, and you see a business of PE of two, and the PE of three business has better management, go for the business of PE of three. Farak nahi padega in the end he still goes for the two. <laughs> and so I'm still working on him. Now he's willing to go to 2.5, so we're getting there. Eventually we'll get there. Yeah, so I found, I found Turkey, the FS and CCI and the quality of the, the governance and the management. And when you have a bottling business with Coke or Pepsi as a bottler, as a partner, clearly the Coke and Pepsi business is vastly superior. You know, much higher returns on capital. But the bottling business can be a really good business. Because basically, both these companies want the bottlers to do well. And they set up the bottlers to do well. So like, for example, in Pakistan, the case volume, 15 years ago, the unit case volume that Coca-Cola Isaac had was about 40 million cases a year, 15 years ago. Now it is 400 million cases. And it's 400 million cases in a basket case country with a lot of problems. Like right now their issue is just getting foreign exchange in and out is difficult because Pakistan has no foreign exchange. So somehow they are trying to make that work. And with all of that stuff, it's still a 400 million cases market. But in, in that, in the Pakistan market, for example, Coke set up Coke Studio. You know, they have it in India too, but they have Coke Studio Pakistan. And that has been enormously successful. And so Coke Studio Pakistan, for example, is completely paid for by the Coca-Cola company. It's not paid by the bottler. So all that branding is done by the Coca-Cola company for the benefit of the bottler, which also benefits the Coca-Cola company. So it's a symbiotic relationship. So I just wanted to share some of these thoughts where, you know, I look at, I look at India and I see a lot of positives versus Turkey, right? I mean, we have a stable currency, we have proper leadership, we have amazing growth, a lot of great demographics going on, but we also have not cheap valuations, my, my vantage point. And so I say, okay, you know, we can just stick to where it, appears more of a no-brainer to me. We see this play out. So for example, if you look at Microsoft in 99, you know, it was 22 billion revenue, or eight, nine billion of net income, and the market cap was 600 billion. And trailing PE was like more than 70. And 16 years after that, they had a lot more revenue. Revenue had gone more than four times. Net income had not changed much, but it was still higher. And market cap was one half of where it was. And if you look at the, you look at the Microsoft chart from 99 to 2015, including all the reinvested dividends, the return was zero. And it's a great business. It's, it's been a great business throughout that time, you know, but it was just too expensive. And if we look at Coca-Cola itself, you know, in 98, 19 billion revenue, three and a half billion net income, and like I said, trailing period of 62. 2011, business had more than doubled. Net income has more than doubled. 
and PE has shrunk and market cap has shrunk. It went again from 98 to 2011, like 13 years with zero returns, even though there's another great business. You know, Buffett's quote, you know, you pay a very high price in the stock market for a cheery consensus. This is my pickup truck in Texas. You know, once when I moved to Texas, I bought a pickup truck and we can put whatever license plate we want on it. So I put FS as a license plate. And I'm trying to make my neighbors rich, but they don't seem to be interested. So that's okay. So those were some of the thoughts I wanted to share with you. Thank you. So we can talk about whatever you'd like to talk about. One month P bank you were talking about. In yeah, yeah, point one P, yeah. yeah. So what changed in that bank? You said the, the true values are phase two, one billion, one point five billion. And you said the active the, the investors started respecting the performance, understanding the performance, or better investors came into the company. What changed it? Oh, you're, you're talking direction. about the warehouse company, not the bank, right? Yeah. The warehouse company. Where are you? Sorry, warehouse company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think, I think what changed is exactly what Ben Graham says, that in the long run, the stock market is a weighing machine. I mean, it just, it made no sense to have a valuation like that. And you know, I talked to the promoters. At the time, it was 16 million. And I told them at that point, I said, why don't you buy back the shares? And the, they're not financial guys, they're operators. And any, for most management teams, buybacks make no sense. Because basically what happens is, the cash leaves the company and you see nothing, right? The cash is gone. And the stock price may not change immediately. And so management teams always look at this and say, if I give a dividend, somebody got the money, right? But if I give a, if I do a buyback, where did the money go? It disappeared somewhere. It didn't go back to my shareholders. They, they don't say they got money, they got no money. To me, the bigger question was, how could it sit at that value, <laughs> at that price in such a market? And, and even now, actually, one of the things that has not changed is that the local Turkish ownership in that business has only gone down. So local Turks have still not, it's foreign investors who have bought the stock. But it hasn't been uh, local Turkish investors. And I have not been, I have not participated at all. I mean, I've, we have zero trading activity in that stock for four years. And so some things are mysteries. But and that's exactly what Ben Graham said to Senator Fulbright when he was called. He said that Senator Fulbright told him, he said, look, a stock is trading at $10. You think it's worth $20. What are the market forces or what are the forces that make it go from 10 to 20? And Ben Graham's response was that this is one of those mysteries that we don't know the answer to. But what we do know is that in the long run, if it's worth 20, it'll get to, be, it'll get to trade, trade at 20. And so even for myself, when I invested in Resas, I knew that the currency is a major problem. But the assets are really in land and steel and cement and concrete. That's what a warehouse is. And all of those are inflation indexed, right? It's basically, so my take was if the currency goes crazy or whatever goes happens, we have those prime assets in a major city, they should be able to retain their value because all of these things will increase in price. And that's exactly what happened. The, the, the value to build a warehouse kept going higher and higher. And therefore their warehouses, the rents kept going higher. And it kind of worked that way. So. Hello sir, my name is Nikunj. And I have two questions, one on Dakshina and one on the investing side. So we've heard you saying that uh, you know, you don't have analysts because you don't like to dismiss ideas that they'll keep bouncing all the time. And some place we've heard that now where you live, sometimes you wake up even after the markets are on. So just wanted to understand your process, the team, the structure and the thought process behind it for the Pavarai Fund per se. I'm sure there is an intention behind it. So if you can talk about how you operate, how your structure, routine, 
Yeah, I mean, I, so I never worked in the industry. You know, basically when I, when I started for Bry Funds, it was my first, really my first job or anything you can say in the industry, right? I never worked in any other place. All of my kind of thoughts and perspectives on how to structure things basically came from Warren and Charlie. So one of the things I looked at was that neither of them had any help. They didn't have help then and or not even today, right? So I said, Berkshire can easily afford to have a whole army of analysts if they want, and they have zero. So I said, if that's the way they're doing it, then I'll just copy that. And, and I felt that basically the issue we have in investing anyway is that the data set is too large. So even if you have a team of 10 analysts, how many sh stocks can they cover or go through in a year? It's just a handful, you know. Really kind of tearing apart a company might take a few months, right? It might take a few weeks, few months. So one guy can maybe do five, 10, 15 companies at the most. And if you have 10 people, maybe you can do 100 companies in a year. There are 50,000 companies globally. So even if you do 100 companies, you know, you're like not even 1% of the data set. So basically, the issue is that the data, I always felt the data set is too large. That you're not really going to be able to have any way of being able to look at the entire 50,000 and figure out where the opportunity is and whatever else. In my opinion, you have to have some kind of hacks or some kind of shortcuts. And so it's not, it may not be much of a handicap to have a small team versus a big team if the small team is employing some hacks which get them to a smaller data set, which the big team may not get to. They may be going through a bigger data set. So my thinking was that, you know, there are, there are places like Value Investors Club in the US or Sum Zero, Data Roma, different places where you can basically start trimming the data set. If I, if I say that I'm only going to buy top two or three holdings of 20 investors I admire, that trims the data set a lot, right? That would <coughs> basically make my universe to look into about 60 companies. And the first thing I'd do with the 60 companies is say, which one's outside circle of competence? That might throw away 40, 50 of them, right? So now the data set is only 10, 12 companies. You don't need a big team for 10 to 12 companies. You can get to that pretty much on your own. So for Bry Funds, I think for most of the time I operated just myself, I had started another business and I had hired a couple of guys for that business. It was in the insurance business. We, it was a mistake. We sold the company and we moved on. But I liked the guys, so I kept them. So they, they help me now. The two of them, are, they're really good. But they don't generate ideas. And I told them, please don't generate ideas. I can tell you what to do. And it's actually a very good compliment because they are really good at the deep dives. And they're really good at identifying what might be blind spots for me. And so it actually works pretty well. So it's been a, it's been a good mix. But basically, I don't, I don't really think you need teams for doing this. I don't think this is a team sport. I, I, I'm Kuntal here. So when you saw turkeys being so cheap and abundance of supply as well as rising and good quality companies and you had a view, how did you size up the position and how did you execute and how did you did the, how did you execute the whole thing and, and what were the consideration in position sizing? How many companies you took up and can you just give some flavor of how did you? Yeah, so my, my sizing is really simple. If I I'm going to take a bet. I ideally want to make it a 10% position. I don't want to have 50 stocks in my portfolio. I, I will not be able to come up with 50 ideas that I'm excited about. And so basically, it's for practical purposes, it's a 10 by 10 portfolio. So if I'm going to make a bet, I would like to make a 10% bet. Now, in the case of Resas, I was managing 
about 700 million, and our bed size was 8 million. It was little more than 1%. But I had no choice, you know. I mean, that's just, I couldn't put more into it. You know, that was the max in that particular case. I would have loved to have a 10% allocation to raise us, but the market cap is 16 million, so I can't do much. FS, I could take a full 10% position, no problem. We only have three beds in Turkey. We have another company which is TAV Airports. They run airports in about a dozen countries. Just incredible management. I like the, like the team and I like their assets a lot. So basically, basically those two businesses were large enough where I could put 10% of assets into them. And on the other side, if it becomes a large position, I will not trim because it's large. So basically, one of the issues that came up was that I have three different funds in the US. Uh, and the reason I have three different funds is that the regulations require me to separate the investors into different buckets. So one of our funds is a offshore fund that's for non-US investors and for like endowments and foundations and so on. So as it turned out, when we were making the bet in Resas, a lot of the money came from one of the funds. So 20% of Resas, the warehouse company, is inside one fund, which has about, now it has about 270 million or something in assets. And the Resas position in that fund <laughs> is about 100 million. So it was a very small investment, but it's gone up a lot. So basically, its value in the fund is like maybe close to 40%. So I basically just, every quarter, I remind all my investors that we have a concentration situation here. And I'm not planning to trim the position. And if you are uncomfortable, you can exit. But basically, because we are still sitting undervalued, I mean, the business is sitting at probably one third of where it should be sitting, and they will raise, increase the value very <laughs> smart. And I think that that company may be worth four or five billion in five, 10 years or something. So we just want to just keep that. And I think most investors, they are very comfortable. They've understood what it is. I don't have a large portion of their assets. So I think they're kind of okay with it. So but basically, that's how we we've tried to allocate it. Basically, make a 10% bet, it becomes more in value, <coughs> then that works out fine. Just to digress a little bit, just kind of some interesting things that take place outside India, just to give you a little bit of a flavor. The airport business is not such a great business. And the reason it's not such a great business is that it's a negotiated transaction. You know, they are BOT models, right? So basically what happens is that the government entity or whoever is basically giving you the deal, number one, it is competitive. When the bidding is taking place, it's competitive. And there are animal spirits involved. And usually those auctions will end up above intrinsic value price. Because these assets come up for sale so rarely that if you have Bangalore Airport, if you have you know Mumbai Airport or something come up, a lot of people have an interest in those assets. So generally speaking, you don't tend to get great deals on them. The business is interesting. It's actually a complex business because parts of the business are regulated and parts of the business are not regulated. So for example, if you have duty-free, duty-free is not regulated. So you have an airport, you have space for duty-free. Pretty much most of the deals around will let you charge whatever you want and do whatever you want with the duty-free area. And just to give you a little bit of a flavor of what happens in duty-free, which might help you in your duty-free shopping a little bit. If you are looking at some $100 bottle of liquor in a duty-free shop, the factory gate price of that liquor is about $25 to $30, just FYI. So at the, at the factory gate, it's about $25 to $30. The airport operator charges 40% of the selling price as his rent. One of the only places where no one is telling him what he can do. So he's saying this is the place to make money. So he, so when you buy the $100 bottle of liquor, $40 goes to GMR or whoever is running that airport. And then 
the liquor, the duty-free operator has to have staff and inventory and all of that. They have some costs. And so they'll make five, ten dollars and then the rest is the expenses to run the place. So that's just the economics of how the duty-free works. But what happened in TAV airports, there are actually two Harvard case studies on TAV airport which drew me in. There's an airport in Almaty in Kazakhstan, which basically the guy who owned it wanted to get rid of it. Some oligarch owned that airport. He had a lot of oil assets, and airports are very management intensive to run. So he just wanted to get rid of it. It was too much of a headache for him. And that airport basically was not a BOT airport. It was an outright purchase, which means that whoever bought it just owns it forever. There is no negotiation about anything. After that, charge whatever you want, do whatever you want. It's free for all. TAV had negotiated to buy that airport in 2019. And they were going to close the deal in 2020. And then COVID happened. And air traffic went to zero. So TAV told the seller that, listen, force majeure because all of their airport's revenue has gone to zero, basically. So they're facing their own issues. And they said, force major, basically, we don't want to do the deal. And the guy who owned the airport said, I will drop the price. Let's do the deal. So they talked about it. And I think in that deal closed in 21 at a discounted price. And it was 80% financed, 4% uh, interest for 25 years. So it was only 20% equity. So basically, and they had agreed to build a new terminal. So basically, the economics of the whole thing was they put in about 100 million of equity. And that airport probably in the next couple of years will be making about 200 million a year after tax and after all interest payments and so on. And that 200 million is going up about 10% a year for as far as the eye can see, because Kazakhstan is a rich country. It's got a lot of growth happening. It's a landlocked country. So actually, the size is bigger than Europe. So air travel is the best way to go. And so the air travel is going up like crazy. And so TAV was interesting to me, because the market cap was 800 million. Just the Almaty airport, I think, if it came on the market today, would probably go for like 5 billion or something, maybe more. They'll never sell that. But they have you know, 12 other airports. And they have the 40% duty free and all of that going on. So it works OK. But And that airport is just like, I mean, the interesting thing is most of their revenue, all of their revenue in all the airports, including Turkey, are all in euros. The contracts are all in euros. There's nothing to do with Lira. And, but because it trades in Istanbul, it is being handled by the gamblers, like bank gamblers, which makes my life very easy. So that's where we end up. Just your thoughts on China. There's a fire sale, sort of fire sale going on there. I'm sorry? China. Any views on China? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I find China a lot harder. I think it's, we've, we've had some investments that have not worked in China. We've had some investments that have worked extremely well. And one of the things that happened is that I had to, I was forced to make changes in the way I was operating during COVID because I couldn't travel, we couldn't go to China, we couldn't go to a lot of, lot of places. So I took it off the radar. And there are, basically, there are limited bullets in the gun. You know, I have only so many hours in a day and so many things to do. So something showed up actually on the radar, which were in the US that looked really good. So most of my time, I think, <coughs> in 23, I spent on US markets, which was, I think, was a good place to be for the things we were looking at. But I have not, I have not spent much time on China in a while. But I, I, I think that one of the things that comes up, I think, from my vantage point is there's a significant headwind if you go into a country where the population is declining. You have to look at the business. You have to look at businesses where they're more export-oriented. So like Japan, for example, Japan always trades very cheap. But it's at a very pretty intense 
drop in population taking place and aging workforce, not that much interest in immigration and all of that. And so Japan can work if I think you look at businesses which are, their fortunes are tied to things outside Japan. I think like Buffett's bets work really well because those five companies, a lot of their assets are outside Japan. So I, I, there are not that many places in the world where you have a rising population. So India has that big trump card that it has a rising population and it has significantly rising per capita GDP. So those are, those are very good ingredients. So we haven't, we haven't spent a lot of time in China lately. My question is, when does one sell a stock, in your opinion? Say, Vagung Beverages, if I had bought it, or somebody has bought it, $2 billion, $3 billion. Company is delivering above expectation. And they are trying to add more levers for growth. Yeah. Now, what does one do? At six, seven billion, it became very expensive. But what, in your opinion, how should one think? I think selling is a lot harder than buying. You know, buying is easy. Selling becomes hard. And something like Varun becomes very hard if you have a big gain. Usually it is a mistake to sell a great business because of valuation. I would say that if I were a owner of Varun and I was sitting on a 5x gain or something, I would give it a lot of rope, you know. It, would, it might be a mistake, you know, to give it a lot of rope. But I think that a lot of mistakes I made have been where a lot of money was left on the table because something looked optically expensive. So Varun has tailwinds in the sense that Pepsi loves them. Pepsi will give them more. And depending on where those geographies are and what the economics of those deals are, it could work extremely well. And I may be wrong about the NARTDs of India. You know, I'm, it just looks like something like 700 looks really high to me for a country like India. It's less than 100 today, maybe 100, 120. So to go up 7x, that's a lot. And so, but I would just say that basically if you are in the happy position of owning a great business, you should give it a lot of growth. That's what I learned, is I, I regret a lot of sales that I made of really good businesses because they looked what I considered overvalued, and it turned out I was wrong. Uh, good evening. When you made these investments in Turkey, yeah. was dividends a part of the consideration? Like, there's cash flow generation, but how, how does it come back to you? Yeah, I've, I haven't, I usually never paid that much attention to dividends because I just, I view it as if the company keeps it and uses it prudently, that's fine. If they are returning it, so in the case of FS, the family basically only gets paid through dividends. So because they have a joint venture partner with two different international companies, Coke and am in Bev, I don't think they can change their ownership. Because I think that they've kind of agreed to, okay, I'm at 50%, you're at 20%, and we're not gonna change that ratio. So even if the stock goes really low, they will not buy shares or any of that. So basically what the family is doing is, they're saying, okay, what does the business need to run? Let the business keep that. And the rest, it can be pushed out to the family. Which is fine, I mean, if that's what they want to do, that's okay with me. I just wanted to go back on the ISEC example. So if you look at the balance sheet, for example, right? I think the net debt to EBITDA is 0.6. So there's some leverage on the balance sheet. So given the volatility of earnings, if you take 2038 as your terminal value, how do you assess predictability of cash flows when you look at interest expense on the debt side, as well as revenue versus cost of goods sold mismatch for Forex? So when you look at 10 years forward in such a volatile currency, how much value do you assign to like predictability of cash flows? So in the case of FS and in i6 case, in both cases, net debt is close to zero. So they hold a lot of cash and they have debt. And they try to kind of balance those things with their, the different currencies they're dealing with. So I don't think, at the, at the end of the day, I think that falls in a noise category. 
I don't think it, it really matters that much because they really, if they just paid off the debt, right, they would have very little debt left. So if you really look at it on an adjusted basis, it should be okay. The business actually is basically inflation indexed. So what a Coke sells for will adjust with inflation. And so, you know, if, if, I mean, they will face, they may face some issues because one of the things that happens with the high inflation economy like Turkey is the wage earner gets screwed. So wages are not going up at the rate of inflation. That's actually a real issue in Turkey, which means that the population is getting impoverished. And which means that their buying power for products like Coke is going down. But Coke, I don't think, would have a problem raising prices. They may have some issues with volumes. But what we have seen in the last few years has been that basically volumes are growing, or they've been very stable, and their earnings have been stable. And the other thing is that because they're in so many different countries, Turkey is only, I think it's less than 40%, maybe 35% of their total volume is coming from Turkey. So there are other countries, and it's a mix of countries. So basically, for the most part, you're basically dealing with a basket of currencies. And in effect, I think with a product like Coke, you are ending up with a margin independent of the currency. So would love to hear your thoughts on how you evaluate other Yeah, I, I would say that a country like India with 5,000 listed companies, there should be a lot of opportunity, even with those elevated PEs and all that. Because basically, if you're looking at the small cap, mid cap space, and you're digging in to those businesses, you may be able to identify businesses where you can see around the corner, and the market can't see around the corner. right? So you can see that this business may triple in a few years, and the market doesn't understand that. And so optically, it may appear expensive. But when you adjust for what might happen in the future, it doesn't appear expensive. So I think that if you are a kind of hardcore value analyst, and if you're limited to India, then you roll up your sleeves and do the work. And I'm sure you would find plenty of opportunities because the growth is there. So there'll always be mispriced bargains and such. But if you're someone like me who's lazy, and doesn't want to do the work. I mean, for me, it, it's really hard for me to justify really spending a lot of time on Indian equities when there are these low-hanging fruit other places, right? So I, I feel like I want to, like I'm going to make another trip to Turkey in a few months, and I just want to make sure that I think I've pretty much met with every company that is worth meeting with. But I'll just do one more pass on each one just to make sure that I haven't missed something. Or what is probably possible is that some business actually is truly great, but I don't I didn't understand it the first time. And so I'll just leave it to that. And and if I do run into things that drop into my lap which are based in India where there's some nuance which is causing the thing with I would say with investment analysis is there are so many things taking place inside each business. And if you have a really good understanding of the companies, you may be able to see things that others can't see because you are, you've just got the depth of knowledge. And then that can give you an edge. So I think that's very possible in India. But it's much harder for someone like me not being here. Right? I mean, I'm, I'm not spending all my time looking at Indian equities. I'm not meeting with them. I'm not like kicking the tires, all the scuttlebutt. A lot of things are much more removed. And so it makes it a little bit harder and, and such. So I think it's, it's a perfectly good market. But I would also say that if you are an investor and now you know India has the rules that you can send a quarter million a year out per family member and so on, that I think some of you should look at equities outside India. Especially, I think, at this time, I think that 
it's not the greatest place to be looking. You may have a better view than I do because I'm looking from the outside looking in. So I think it's worth looking at, you don't need to go to Turkey, but I think it's worth looking at other markets. And one of the things I was trying to do with the Varun example was trying to show a similar business in another geography with very similar characteristics. And actually, we didn't talk about this, but Coke is a much stronger brand. So in Europe, I was surprised that Coke volumes are five times, five or six times the Pepsi volumes. It's a huge delta. In India, it's the reverse, right? Which is probably why Coke is upset, because basically Coke does not expect any country where they have lower market share than Pepsi. In the US, it's about three to one. And Pakistan used to be Pepsi majority, but now it's 50-50. They're both neck to neck. So ISIC has done a good job of kind of bringing that up to par. So I think as an investor in Indian equities, it's worth looking at things outside, sometimes from a comparison point of view. And to the extent that you have capital that can go into some of those ideas, it may be worth looking at those. Earth is expected to be put in by government of India. And you've uh, mentioned over there that it could take 10 to 15 years before we see some success or some growth. So how, how do you approach you know, the milestone over a 15 year period when you're looking at that? Yeah, I mean, I think that anytime you have a school, I mean, you know, so we, we get the kids after 10 standards. So if the government opens a new school, an EMRS school, these are schools for tribals, and the government is putting a, they've done a big step function in terms of amount of money they're putting into the tribal school, which is really wonderful to see. Basically, if they open a new school, it's going to take three or four years to open the school. You know, you'll buy the land or you get the land and you create the infrastructure, spend the money and create a school, and then you'll take the first batch in six standard. And after five years or six years, that batch will come to 10 standard, which is when Dakshna can deal with them. So basically, I'm already at nine or 10 years from today before I see that first batch show up. And now it's a new school. They have no history. They've hired new teachers. The quality will be not that great, right? So that will also take time. So. It may really be 20 years, it could be even 25 years before we are able to see the real, and it really depends very heavily on quality of the people. So, you know, the problem here is that you're talking about government employees, principal of a government school, administrators of a tribal belt school in a rural area, in some tribal area, just for them to get quality teachers, even if they had the best management, would be extremely challenging, right? So whether they can actually make this money work with all the best intentions, we don't know that. You know? So there's, I think there's a lot of challenges. We are basically, at Dakshna, I mean, I think one of the things that Buffett says about charity and investing, which is so different from each other, is that in in investing, we do everything to minimize risk. In charity, in baseball terms, he says that you should swing for the fences. So if you really want to make a difference in charity, you have to go high risk, high return. You cannot take a low risk, high return approach that we take in investing. So it's a completely different mindset where we should be very willing to lose the money. And that's what we are doing. So right now, we, have, we just started a partnership with EMRS and two of the guys who are running Dakshna are here. And they were telling me, you know, we've had a long partnership with the Navodaya Vidyalaya school system for 17 years, we've 16 years had a partnership with them. And they were saying that, you know, on a one to 10 scale, if the Navodaya management is a seven out of 10, and I have a lot of problems with Navodaya management, you know, there's a lot of issues we run into with them, which we roll our eyes about. They said the EMRS management is a four out of 10. So that's a alarming, alarming statistic right there. 
But at the same time, the thing is that the scheduled tribe population of India is more than 100 million. And the scheduled caste population of India has actually been helped a lot by all the affirmative, affirmative action programs. In fact, I think they can almost get rid of the, it will not work politically, but I think they can get rid of the SE thing. So they can reduce that schedule by 80%, no problem. Won't happen, but they could reduce it if they really chose to. But the tribes, there's been no real progress in their per capita, healthcare, different metrics for 70 years. Even with all the different reservations, everything that have happened. So I think the tribal situation is pretty bleak. I was really happy to see that Modi government is at least putting money behind it. But it will take more than money. I think it's very challenging. So at Dakshana, we said, OK, we, this will be probably like 5 10% of our spending. And yeah, we can, we can take a chance on 5 10%. I apologize, I've just been a little under the weather. I'm Harsh Rastogi, I'm a student at Plain. So my question is about Coca-Cola and Pepsi, a can of Coke as a product. So you mentioned India has a lot of these tailwinds, growing population, growing economy. But we Indians have a lot of diabetes as well. So 10% of India has diabetes, 23% if you include pre-diabetics as well. And the number is 2x if you're looking at urban Indian population. And what that does is for a can of Coke, it takes it from being a complimentary good to my dinner to a substitute substitute good essentially, wherein you have to think whether I eat that extra batura or have that can of food. So in that sense, how do, you, how do you look at this dynamic playing out in the projections that we make for these goods? Yeah, so they actually got, they've had this tailwind for a while, but they actually got a big tailwind when they came out with Coke Zero and Pepsi came out of Pepsi Zero because the taste differential was relatively minor and you wiped out the sugar. And in fact, the funny thing, which I didn't think about, but the bottlers were telling me, is sugar is a big portion of their total cost. So they say that actually their margins are higher on the zero product than the regular Coke product because the sugar is gone. It's like 3-4% uh, better margins on. So the product is healthier, and they make more money. And they, they charge the same, you know, there's no price differential. So I think that the other thing to keep in mind about both these companies is that they have about 200 brands. And it's a pretty diverse portfolio of things beyond the, basically the regular Coke product. So basically these companies are offering alternatives which would allow you to sidestep those issues. And so it should be OK. I mean, they, these, these concerns about sugar and diabetes and so on, they've been around for a while. But it has not impacted the businesses. So the businesses are continuing to do fine. And part, part of it is because Diet Coke took off a lot, and then Coke Zero has taken off a lot. And some of these other products have taken off a lot. And so that's worked out. Is there any sign of their taking off in India as well? You're talking about Coke Zero? Yeah, Zero. Is you need to tell me. I'll have a look. Have you, have you, is Coke, is Pepsi Zero doing well in India? Coke Zero, Pepsi Zero, how are they doing in India? Diet Coke is doing well. Pardon? Yeah, but he has a concern that it's killing everyone. No, no, just, just, I, I just wanted to know because 20, that wipes out 20 per, percent. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that I don't know what the ratios in India are of, Pepsi Zero versus Pepsi. I, it's not something I've studied, but it's probably something worth looking at. Two questions. A, can you tell us about some mistakes that you made and how that happened? And two, when you look at, like you said, you look at Turkey, not talking from any data, but headlines. Doesn't it scare you that you're going into a country with many things, I mean, you know, the kind, the kind of move that you saw on the currency from 5 to 29 to a dollar. Do you see that happening? Do you see that stabilized? Do you have a view on that? Have you looked at it like that? Or you don't care? Well, I mean, let me take your uh, second question first. I assumed when I was investing in 
2018, 2019, that the currency would get decimated. I assume that would happen. In one of the businesses, which was the airport business, all their revenue is in euros. So it's based in Turkey, but they have no exposure. In fact, they have a tailwind because their staff is paid in lira, Turkish lira. So actually their earnings have been going up as the lira has been collapsing because the wages have not gone up at the same rate. So in their case, actually, the Turkish inflation helped them. In the second case of the Coke bottler, there were two issues. One is that 60, 70 percent of the business was outside Turkey. And even the business inside Turkey, it's hard to imagine Coke not being able to make money. Because they would, they would adjust the price. And if the volume adjusts, then they, basically what we have seen happen is we haven't seen any volume drop off and we haven't seen any margin drop off. So it's been pretty benign. So I, I think in a place like Turkey, probably 97% or 98% of businesses are not investable. And I took a pass on this. So basically, the first filter I used was that what is the impact high inflation would have on this business? And the answer came back in 10 seconds that it would be horrible. And so we basically, I just, it was very easy for to filter out the businesses. And, and that was basically what the play was, is that the baby got thrown out of the bathwater. right? So what I was going after is the babies that were thrown out. And I didn't want to buy the bathwater, but I wanted to look at the rest. And so, but I would also say in investing, you know, going to mistakes and also correlating with this is that probably 50% or 50% error rate on what we buy would be par. You know, half the things that we invest in are unlikely to do for us what we think it should do for us. And the reason is that we are trying to look into the future. And by definition, there's so many variables that are going to affect the future that 50% error rate in that type of activity is perfectly normal. And so even when I look at my portfolio today and I look at different things that are in the portfolio and I can see that they all look OK to me, I still know at the back of my mind that there are mistakes in there that I can't see that will manifest themselves over time. And so if I look back at the mistakes, probably the biggest area that I have had trouble with in the past has been leverage. So I had, in, I had invested in a some subprime mortgage lender in early 2007. And basically, it went to zero. So we had a 10% bet. It went to zero, right? We had a bet on a zinc, zinc producer, which was basically transitioning from an old plant to a new plant. And they ran into a lot of issues with the new plant and trying to get it commissioned. And they had a lot of debt. And it went to zero, went to bankruptcy and went to zero. Another 10% loss. And so I would say that I think Pabrai funds will be 25 years old in uh, six months. There will be a long list of mistakes. We'll be here till midnight if I go through the mistakes. But I would say that what I've tried to look at is what are the themes, right? And so, for example, I try to avoid the leverage businesses because I know that basically any time a business has debt, they have taken away some anti-fragility. Fiat Chrysler. So Fiat had just taken a, they took ownership of Chrysler during the, and the market cap of Fiat Chrysler was about $5 billion. And their revenue was about $140 billion. And you know, Chand met Sergio in Detroit. And he was lighting one cigarette with the next. You know, that's what Chand was telling me, that before one cigarette was over, he was already on the next cigarette. So anyway, so Fiat, Fiat Chrysler was really cheap. It was $140 billion. Uh, revenue, it was five billion market cap. We had this rock star CEO that had come in, Sergio Marchioni, and he had issued guidance. He had actually told the world what he would deliver in 2018. So in 2013, he was saying, 
this will be my revenue, this will be my net income, blah, blah, blah. And the net income he was projecting was more than the market cap of the company. So he was saying that in 2018, I'll produce like 7 billion, and the market cap of the company is 5 billion. So, and I spent about three months studying Fiat Chrysler, and I came to the conclusion that this, is what, this was a very unusual CEO, probably one of the best CEOs I'd seen. And, uh, and Kareem in Coca-Cola Isaac reminded me of Sergio. And it was a big home run for us. Basically, I'd put 70 million. I think we eventually collected more than 300 million, 350 million on that investment. So it was a good return. But what I did not appreciate is that inside Fiat Chrysler was 80% of Ferrari. And at the time when uh, I made the investment, I think Ferrari was making like 200 million profit a year. So I said, you know, in my head, I said, okay, it's worth two, three, four billion or something. Even if I take out your 20 multiple to it, it's worth about four billion. I thought the Fiat business is worth more than 50 million because it just was so mispriced. So I didn't really pay attention to Ferrari that much. And then after a few years, they, they took Ferrari public at a valuation that looked quite rich. So I said, okay, this management team is smart. They have actually looked at this business. They are getting a good price for it. I think the market cap was like at that time when Ferrari was going public, maybe eight, nine billion, and they were making three, 400 million in profit at the time. And so I said, okay, if it's going public and it's sitting at this value, it doesn't look like they would do that if there was a lot of value still in the business. And I actually didn't understand the business well enough. In the meantime, I think while I owned the, owned the stock, I got to know the Agnelli family quite well. I, John Elkan, who was the chairman of the group, he became a good friend. And we used to take, every time I would meet John, we, we used to always meet for a long walk. He never wanted to meet for lunch or dinner or something. He's like the kind of Italian royalty with the Agnellis and all that. So we would always have these long walks in different parts of the world. Like one time was Santa Monica Beach, and one time was uh, Central Park. Central Park was actually twice. And one time was Colaba in Mumbai. And I asked him if he was okay with He said, yeah, yeah, we need all experiences in life. I said, it's going to be crowded for like Sunday or something. He said, yeah, it's fine. We'll walk through Kolavaka Causeway. And so I got to know John very well over the years. And I told John that, you know, I made so much money in Ferrari and all this, so I think I should get the car. So he said, look, I can help you with delivery. I cannot help you with price. We don't give discounts to anyone. So I said, I'm not looking for price discount. I made enough money on the company that I can pay full price. So he moved, basically Ferrari doesn't produce any cars which are not already pre-sold. You know, they don't produce for putting in a showroom to sell. And usually it's like two, three year waiting list to get a car. So he bumped me up, so in about four months I got my Ferrari. But by the time I got the car, I had already sold most of the stock. And I really understood the value of Ferrari and the value of that brand after I got the car. That's really when I really, because when I went to pick it up, so when I ordered the car, I asked the car dealer, do you want a deposit on the car? He said, no, no, we don't need a deposit. You can give me $100, it's fine. And then he told me, your car has arrived. So I went to pick it up. He said, look, I want to just let you know that if you don't take delivery, I'll give you $100,000 right now. So I said, can you explain to me your side of the equation? <laughs> like, you know. He said, look, there are people who want Ferraris who don't want to wait for two years for a new one. So they want a new car. And if you drive it off the lot and you put 100 miles on it, I can't give you that offer. Because they want a brand new car with zero miles, right? And they can't get a brand new car with zero miles for two and a half years. So. The 100,000 is a compression of that time to two days from two and a half years. 
And I said, you are giving me 100,000. He said, yeah, yeah, I have a heavy markup on top of that. <laughs> so I am taken care of, don't worry. But I can give you 100,000, you know. So anyway, I didn't take the deal, I took the car. But I really understood the kind of brand value as I was kind of going through the ownership and driving it and all of that. We made a $70 million investment in Fiat. Effectively, the Ferrari portion of that investment was about 16 million or so. We probably made like 70, 80 million on that 16 million when we sold it. And if I held it till today, it would be more than 500 million on the Ferrari portion. Uh, the Fiat portion was another couple of hundred million, but, and that's 500 million and counting. You know, we're not done. Because now I've understood that that brand and the value of that brand will keep growing, you know. So Ferrari can come out with, so you know, it's kind of like they have a factory which produces Picassos. So you have a factory that produces Picassos. And so they'll, they'll I remember a friend of mine in California, he said to me, I need to come see you, Monish. I need to come see you right away. So I said, okay. So he came, he said, you're friends with the guy, the chairman of Ferrari, and I need you to ask him for a favor. So I said, I'm not gonna ask him for any favors, but tell me what you're looking for. So he says that I want the Ferrari Monza, okay? And I said, ye Ferrari Monza kya hai? So Ferrari Monza is a one-seater car, not even a two-seater. Means you can't take a date on it, okay? One-seater. What is the point of a one-seater Ferrari? I can't understand what the point of that is. So he said, look, they are producing 300 Monzas, and they are only giving them to people who own 20 or more Ferraris each. So they have gone through their list, their Ferrari customer list. Number one on the list has 70 Ferraris. Usko invite kar diya ke tum Monza le lo. Number two on the list. So it's by invitation. So this is the funny thing about the Monza. The Monza in the United States is not street legal. So you cannot actually get it registered and you cannot drive it on a public street. And so if you buy a Monza in the United States, what Ferrari will do is, so first of all, the price of the car is two and a half million. Okay, so you will give Ferrari two and a half million dollars. They will not deliver the car to you. They will keep possession of the car. When you want to drive the car, they will deliver the car to a racetrack. Then you will go around the racetrack alone. <laughs> okay, get whatever thrills you are getting from that racetrack driving. You will give them back the car and they will put it in their storage and every month they're gonna charge you about $1,500 for the storage of the car. And every time you tell them to deliver the car and take it back, another $5,000 charge for your joyride around the track. <laughs> what I realized is that the rich are getting richer. As you know, the rich are getting richer. And rich men have very few ways in which they can express their wealth. Rich women have more ways to express their wealth. <laughs> but rich men have very few ways. Hum kya kar sakte hain apne paise ka? And Ferrari is one way you can express that. And that's why these guys have these 70 Ferraris and 30 Ferraris. So I went, when I, when I got my Ferrari, I used to get these interesting emails from Ferrari. And one of the emails said that we have something known as Ferrari Driving School. You can, we are inviting you to come to Ferrari Driving School so we can explain to you how to drive the car. So I said, this is a good idea. I need some training. And they said for $18,000 for two days, we will train you on how to drive the car. You know, I was learning about the brand, right? So 
I said, let's go. Let's go two days for Ferrari training school. The good news was because we were going to drive it on a track and all that, they said, you don't need to bring your car. We will have a number of Ferraris. We'll, we'll have a number of Ferrari drivers, instructors, very five-star accommodations, five-star food, everything. So we went, my partner and I, we went to Thermal, California. Thermal, California is a very interesting place. I don't know, I don't want to take up all your time, but I'll just say quickly, because you know how you have golf courses and you have homes around golf courses. The Thermal racetrack had homes around the racetrack. And all the homes on one side had these huge garages where you open the garages and there's parking for 30 cars. And each car is several hundred thousand. And then on the other side, you have a balcony which looks onto the track. And each plot of land is $1 million and then people have built their homes and garages and all that. So that's where the this thing was taking place. It was a whole new world for me. I went there and there are probably maybe around 30, 30 odd Ferrari owners who have come, like me, to learn how to drive. And we were eating dinner, we were eating cocktails. Ho rahe the. So I realized I was asking them the wrong question when I used to get these puzzle looks. So I used, to, I used to go up to some random guy and I said, so which model do you have? And I would get a puzzled look. And then I realized, it's the wrong question. How many do you have <laughs> is a better question. So after two, three of these confused looks, I learned to ask the right question. And then they would say, oh, you know, I've got so many, and I've got this and that, or whatever else, all of that. And many of them had the Monza. You know, so the, there were a number of Monza owners there. And that whole world I saw there, I didn't even know that world existed. You know, it was a different world. So Ferrari can keep going. I mean, basically, there's no limit to what they can do. They come up with some special edition 100-unit car. They can price it for 5 million, 85% margin, 90% margin. And it will all be sold out five minutes after they announce it. So how do you value a company like that? Sir, how do you approach international investing? Because India itself is so heterogeneous that, you know, because of familiarity, we still have confidence. But as a, uh, how do you approach? Because every nation, every country, every company works as a different dynamics, US, Turkey, India, China. So how do you approach investing, international investing in that case? And second, I wanted to know your thought process. What is Varnishi's thought process when he sells a stock? So I wanted to know that. Well, I think on the selling of the stock, I am, I have a lot to learn. I'm, you know, trying to learn. Forums like this help me learn. So that's good. I, I don't think the differences are as large as you might think they are. I mean, I would say that if you were looking at markets like the US or the UK or Germany and so on, you have a lot of things on your side. You know, I can almost assume in the US that if I lose money, it will not be because of fraud. I mean, we have had some fraud, but I think it is so few and far between that every time I'm going to lose money in the US, it's going to be because I made a mistake about something or missed something but not because the company financials were inaccurate or something was you know, misstated or something like that. In other places, if you go, you know, Turkey or China or different places like that, then yes, you have to handicap for some of those things. But I don't think it's that hard to do that. I think you can try to kind of get your arms around it. I think that in, in Turkey, I feel like these businesses that I've invested in, I mean, I've, I had to make a judgment call on the people. And judgment call on people you can make around the world. People are people, basically. And so I don't think those judgment calls are off. I think that, like I said, I think, it, like Buffett says, you know, you can tell few people are ex exceptional, few people are not so good. 
vast majority you can't have an opinion on. So sometimes you can actually look at a, a situation and know that the people are great. And so that can also transcend boundaries and borders and all of that. So that can work out fine. So I think if you dig in, I think that some of these things will, in effect, reveal themselves eventually. What can you tell us about Charlie that we already don't know? OK. Well, I mean, I think the, the thing with Charlie was that it was a very unlikely friendship. You know, I didn't, I didn't ever expect, I mean, you know, Charlie and Warren, you know, we are like talking of people who are like icons. So I never expected really to have any kind of a friendship or anything with either of them. And uh, so with Charlie, I think the friendship went on for about 15 years. I think we, 14 years, we met for the first time in 2009. And so I used to probably meet him maybe four or five times a year for dinner, and then probably maybe on average about once a month for bridge. Bridge would be basically, we would meet on Friday afternoon. We would first have lunch at the LA Country Club, and then there would be about four or five hours of bridge after that. And I remember sometimes I would go to the LA Country Club and four of us would sit down for lunch. And I'm sitting and across the table from me are Rick Gorin and Charlie Munger. And I would tell them, I said, you know, you realize that this is totally surreal. That, you know, this Indian guy is sitting with Charlie Munger and Rick Gorin. And then Rick, Rick passed away a few years before Charlie. And I, I used to ask them different questions about, you know, the early days of investing and so on. And, I think with, with both Munger and Buffett, there is so much in the public domain, and they have been so open that you really can learn everything you need to learn about them from the public record. I think the public record is great. What I learned a lot from Charlie was not so much what he said to me, even though sometimes he would say just very amazing things. It was really watching him and observing him in terms of how he went about his life. And it was really, absurd. so you know, he has eight kids, he has many in-laws, many grandkids, now some great grandkids. He has all these different business partners and friends and all of that. I used to meet many of those people. And sometimes I would meet some of his kids and the kids are on a spectrum, you know, in the sense that there's a range, right? And I used to tell Charlie sometimes, I said, Charlie, you know, so-and-so kid of yours. And he, then he would tell me, I know. You know, <laughs> I, was, I would bring up that there's this weirdness or unusualness about it or whatever else I was going to bring up. And, but I, I found that what, I've, what I realized in his interactions was that he was able to navigate through all of that with a lot of ease. There was a lot of diverse range of personalities. And they were all able to, I mean, he, they all loved him. They all got along well with him. And I learned a lot from the way he navigated through all of that. The other thing I noticed very frequently about him was that he never looked back. And I, I learned a lot from the, the never looking back. So I used to bring up with him frequently that you've had this amazing life, you know, and you've accomplished so much and you've done so much for Berkshire and all of these different things. And he would just brush it off. You know, he, he, he would say his, like, one time he was working on the succession of Daily Journal, you know, finding the next CEO. And all of his attention was on that particular problem. So when I, when I would meet him, it's all he wanted to talk about. You know, basically, so it was like all his energy was focused on the problem at hand. And a lot of us as humans, you know, we've had great lives. We look back and say, oh, I went to a great school. I had this great job. I got these great promotions. I built this business. There's this and that, all these things. He had so many things to look back on. And he just never looked back on any of those things. He just kind of brushed it off and said, okay, just the next problem. So I think the kind of the exact 
exact words he used was that, you know, soldier on. You know, we just have to soldier on. And a few years back, I was really surprised when this happened. So he had already lost sight in one eye because he had a cataract operation that went bad, probably like three decades ago. So he was already just with one eye. About probably five, six years ago, there was some optic nerve issue on the good eye that almost took out all the sight. Like basically, there was a period of time where he couldn't read, he couldn't, almost, he could almost not see anything. And I met him during that time, so they were actually looking at some experimental treatments, they were trying to figure out what to do, because basically the only thing that Charlie, I think, really cared about was reading. The most precious thing to him was reading. And I was observing that here's this guy who's probably reading 500 books a year, spent all his time reading, and he is facing the prospect of eyesight going away. And what I saw is that I did not see any self-pity. I did not see any concern. I actually saw, and he was just saying, I may have to learn Braille. You know, basically he said, I, I, I think I'm gonna have to learn Braille. And Braille would not have helped Charlie because basically the way he reads a book is like he's going back and forth and even an audio book would not work for him. So basically it has to be like a physical book and he needs to be able to go back and forth pretty quickly. So for all practical purposes, it would pretty much destroy him. But even when that was going to happen and possibly go, being going to be permanent, not bothered. I really kind of learned a lot from that, that basically he wasn't looking at, you know, his, his wife fell backwards down the stairs and passed away, you know, basically, and she suffered a lot. She went through a number of surgeries, about 18 months, and for several months he was by her hospital bed at the Mayo Clinic, and basically, I mean, I knew him before she passed away. I knew how important she was to him. I saw him after. I saw no self-pity. He just moved on. Just completely just moved on, you know. And sometimes he would tell me, 99% of my friends are dead, you know. So I said, yeah, but you know, you have new ones, like you're an Indian friend. So it's okay. He said, yeah, I have a lot of younger friends now, which is better. But basically, I, I just saw a guy who was very stoic, who basically never felt that life had given him any misfortune. I think that whatever came to him, in whatever format it came to him. So, you know, his, his family basically, he had a manservant who were, lived with him and took care of him. And his family would visit, you know, different kids would visit from time to time. They had put a, a restriction on how much, how much C candy he could have, right? <laughs> so their rule was that basically about three times a month when there was someone who had come over for dinner, C candy would be served as dessert, right? And now, Charlie likes sea candy a lot. I would see him attack the sea candy, like you've seen him at the annual meetings, like a kid, you know? Because 10 din ke baad mil raha hai, like 15 din ke baad mil raha hai, right? I never saw him ever uh, question that. And I never saw him ever any food that was put in front of him. So I'm very picky about what I'm eating and what. Charlie basically didn't care. You could put any food in front of him, he'll just eat it, he doesn't care. He likes sea candy, it's coming, he'll enjoy it. It's not coming, it's okay. So it's like, you know, the guy is like, he's got no kind of preferences or regrets or any of these things. I think the thing is that he was so evolved that he really was focused on things that mattered. You know, I think a lot of us get focused on things that don't matter. And so I, I just, in all those observations with, with him, and then he had so many jokes, 
you know, I mean, the thing is like an encyclopedia of jokes. Like one time he was saying that something came up about math or something, we were talking about something about math, and he said that there's this Jewish couple and they had this kid who was very distracted, not doing well at school, <coughs> getting poor grades in math. And so they were very concerned, and they found that there's a good Catholic school in the area. And so they admitted the kid to the Catholic school, hoping that better school will make him a better student. And they noticed almost immediately that this kid used to come home, go straight to his room, and start working on his homework, do all his homework, all the math homework he used to do first. So he used to, and he used to never do his math homework before. So they were saying, this is a great school. You know, the guy is like, the kid is transformed. And the grades improved and everything was going great. So they sat down with the kid and they said, how do you like the school? He said, the school is good. And they said, you know, we noticed that you are very interested in the different subjects, you're doing well in school, your math grades have improved, you're doing all the math homework. So he said, look, when I went to the school and I saw that they had pinned the guy on the plus sign and they had, he was dead on the plus sign, I knew that these guys are serious about math. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to step up. So, so Charlie would always have this kind of the, funniest jokes about different things, you know. Lots of great advice over the years. One time I was just about to take a flight from New York to LA and his assistant called me. I was just about to board and she said, Mr. Munger would like to talk to you. And Charlie had not called me before. Usually she would call me and say, you know, are you free for dinner here or there or whatever. But I, I, would, I never had like a phone conversation with Charlie. So I said, okay, Flanedo, let's see what he wants to talk about. And he, he had just read one of my letters to investors where I was explaining to them the mistake I made on Horsehead Holdings, which was a company that went to zero. And he said to me that I have a concern that you're beating yourself up too much about that loss. So he said that, we're going to have losses. We have to learn from those losses. We have to make sure we don't learn too much. And we have to move on. And he said that I noticed in your language, you haven't moved on. And you seem to still be beating yourself about it. So it almost felt to me like a kind of a grandfather was calling me and just saying, it's OK, you know? And uh, he didn't need to make that call. You know, I think, I think he just, that's the kind of person he was. He was very kind. We, we didn't see the kind Charlie at the, Mung, at the Berkshire meetings, et cetera. But behind that kind of hard exterior was a very kind and soft soul. Very, very nice, kind, and soft soul. And Warren is exactly the same way. I think they both have a little bit of a hard exterior to protect themselves. But if you get, if they're interacting with people that they are kind of in their inner circle and there's a lot of trust, then you kind of see through that layer and you see wonderful soul really kind of uh, trying to, you know, live a good life, do a good job and be a good citizen. And also basically, you know, which we've also seen in the workshop meetings, you know, no ego about anything. And Till the end, so I, I had never in all the 14 years that we had a friendship, I never actually asked Charlie to meet me for dinner or something. I never wanted to impose on him. You know, I said, you know, basically, he's got enough going on. So I would always just be in reaction mode. You know, like they would call me and say, are you free at this time? Or, but I, in September of this year, I actually felt that I want to go see him, right? So I basically reached out to his assistant and say, you know, I'd like to come and see Mr. Munger and uh, can, can you see what date would work for him for us to have dinner? 
And she immediately gave me like three, four dates, and I picked one and I went. And it turned out that that was our last dinner. It was exactly one month before he passed away. And even like a month before he passed away, basically, he was always complaining to me that Berkshire has too much cash. We're not able to find anything. You know, there would be like a constant complaint would come out every time. And I, I would always tell him, you guys always find some. You know, you keep complaining, there's no cash, there's no, ideas, there's no this, no that, Apple will happen and Burlington Northern will happen and different things will happen. So I said, the phone will ring, something will happen, don't worry about it. I was talking to him about some of my recent, couple of recent stock ideas and he got very interested in those, in those talks. We had a discussion, he was kind of agreeing with my thesis. So I said, I want you to read about this a little bit more. So he said, yeah, yeah, send it to me. I want to read what, what's going on here, right? And so I had to send him stuff in 24 font. So the smallest size that he could read, 24 font is huge, you know? And I was sending him about 50 pages, which I think became like 600 pages or something. And so probably those were some of the last things he read. But basically, even at that time when he was basically blind, he couldn't read because the books are not at that font size and all of that. No complaints, you know, just kind of posting through everything. And I was asking him, I actually asked him at dinner, I said, you know, Charlie, bridge went away, golf went away, going to the office went away, a lot of your mobility went away. What bothers you? Is there anything that bothers you? All these things have gone away from your life, right? He said, the only thing I wish I had better is I wish I had better eyesight, you know? and so. But even then, I, it's only because I asked him that he brought it up. He did not complain about it. And so basically, I think that he truly actually embraced Ben Franklin as a hero. We had a lot of discussions about Ben Franklin. We had a lot of discussions about Costco. Costco would always come up. Every, every time I met him, at least 20 minutes would go on Costco. It was like the love of his life. And he's always been a Costco shirt and so on. So it was, it was great. So these are some of the some of the memories I have of Charlie. The last one, Rick Green. I yeah. heard about him only when you wrote. I yeah. have not heard about him, so nothing in the public domain. Pardon? There's not much in public domain on Rick Green. Yeah, Rick, Rick actually was a really good guy. So, you know, one time after I got my Ferrari. I think uh, first you'll need to explain because some of us here also may not know enough about who Rick was. Yeah, so... You know, we know that Warren and Charlie were partners. Actually, in many ways, there were three of them. There was Warren, Charlie, and Rick Gurren. Rick Gurren and Charlie Munger were very close friends. And they used to kind of share investment ideas and, you know, look at different things together and so on in the, in the 50s and 60s. And it was Rick who brought up sees candy to Warren and Charlie. And basically, uh, that's how they got introduced to the family. And then they were basically able to, uh, you know, buy. And, and uh, even blue chip stamps was an idea that came through Rick Curran. So um, Rick was a very down to earth, simple, straightforward guy. In 73, 74, when the stock market crashed a lot, he had a lot of margin loans. And basically, the market crash was so extreme that he got a bunch of margin calls. And he was forced to sell his Berkshire Hathaway stock to Warren at basically about $40 a share. You know, the stock that is today at 550,000 per share was at that time $40 a share. And Warren brought it up when I met him for lunch, basically saying that those are the pitfalls of leverage. You know, Warren was saying that, you know, even if you're a slightly above average, average investor, you cannot help that get rich over a lifetime if you never employ leverage. You know, you really can never get hurt, basically. And, and then he gave the example of Rick Gurren, basically saying that, you know, he never got to play out his hand because he got these margin calls, right? And so basically, I think that Rick was able to recover from that 
bottom. Later, him and Charlie Munger together bought Daily Journal. And Rick had the majority ownership in Daily Journal. And uh, so he did fine. I think he was quite wealthy at the time I met him. I remember that one time, the three of us, there were three of us sitting across from Charlie. There was me, Rick, and a guy named Michael, a good friend of Charlie's. And Charlie had just found out that I owned a Ferrari. So he was, he was saying, listen, Monish, I know you spur of the moment made a mistake. It's OK. Sell the car. OK? And it was the only time I never did what Charlie told me. Right? And so I actually told him at that dinner when he was telling me, I said, you know, Charlie, I don't think I can do that. And he just let it go. He just never said anything after. So then next day, we were meeting a bridge. And there are three of us sitting across from him. And Rick Goran had a Ferrari. I had a Ferrari. And the third guy, Michael, drove a Rolls Royce. Right? And so he looked at the three of us and said, what kind of people do I hang out with? <laughs> what kind of people? You know? And Rick was telling me, Rick was telling me, I told Rick, listen, you know, Charlie's telling me to sell the Ferrari. He said, just ignore. And then, you know, he was saying, you know, the Ferrari, Ferrari, and Rolls Royce. And he he believed, he believed that his Hyundai Genesis was the equivalent of a Bentley. You know, he just thought the Hyundai Genesis was so well made that basically it was the, a Bentley at a non-Bentley price, right? So he loved his, his Hyundai. And he couldn't understand why everybody else would just not buy a Hyundai, be happy with it. And, uh, but I think the uh, interesting thing was that he, he also was able to understand, right? Like he never really ever brought up the Ferrari with me again. And I told him, actually, when I moved to Texas, I actually replaced it with this, with the Ram. Because I live in the hills, and the Ferrari would kind of bottom out. It would hit the bottom. And so I said, OK, we need to get rid of the Ferrari. It's too low. And so I switched to a Texas car, which is much better, and a small fraction of the price. And it's, it's worked fine. So yeah, so Rick was a. Rick was a very good, down-to-earth, simple guy. And I think that the three of them, Warren, Rick, and Charlie, they, the, in my conversations with them, it basically, to me, I think uh, that period was kind of like what we see in Turkey today. So that we didn't have competition. Things were cheap. Nobody was really interested in all these things. Uh, things were mispriced. You could do the research, find the deals, kind of keep going. So that what we have going on today, he said, it's completely night and day from that situation at, at that time. And so anyway, that was some of the history with Rick Goran. And Rick, you know, the, Rick was an interesting guy because he had joined the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. So at 85, at the age of 85, he became a sheriff, carrying a gun, you know, having a uniform. And he used to coach soccer till he was past 90. So he was really fit. You know, it was like he was at his high school weight. At 90, he was the same weight when he was 18. So a very fit guy. And very, very nice. All of them were just very nice, down to earth people. You know, no airs about them. It was just great. One of my problems is, which I'm still in kind of, I would say, remedial school on it, is I'm not able to pay up. You know, so one of the issues is that we should be willing to pay up for great businesses. I have a lot of difficulty with paying up. So what ends up happening is I have to find places like Turkey where I don't have to pay up. And then it works. Or I have to find something where there's something the market has missed. You know, there's some anomaly that is causing a mispricing. And then it can work. So yeah, I, like I said, I'm Monish Pabrai and I'm an alcoholic. 
So we, it would be, I still have a lot of learning to do, and one of the learnings I have yet to do is in many, many cases, it is worth paying up. But I can't, I think Ferrari, for me to go pay up for it at, you know, <coughs> four times the price I sold it at would be too painful. Berkshire's market cap would be less than 1% of what it is today. So actually, and Charlie would not take credit for it, but I think even today, even today Warren struggles. So Warren has, you know, a very smart guy. He's come a long ways. He's paid up for a lot of great businesses, but he still has a uh, lot of mental blocks on that front, right? And so, for example, Charlie was never able to convince him to buy Costco, right? And many, many times, I think, I think like, you know, Buffett says that Charlie was the ultimate abnormal, ab abominable no man, right? He'd always say no. And I think his big contribution to Berkshire Hathaway was that Warren would bring up some idea to him and Charlie would run it through a quality filter. And so if the business was cheap and not that great, whatever else, and he knew they would make money on it, he would still tell Warren, don't do it, right? We need to just keep the focus on the great businesses. And I think in the end, even in this year's letter, Buffett, Buffett said that, right? He said 12, 12 decisions have led to most of the value creation of Berkshire in 60 years. So basically one decision every five years was what happened. And that's one of the good learnings in the market is that great investment ideas are probably not going to come up that often. You know, they may come up, probably we see them come up every five years or seven years or something. We are doing really well. So, no, Munger was not, involved much in the Apple decision. I think that was Ted Wexler who made the Apple bet initially, and then Buffett looked at it. And the interesting thing is Ted sold out the position, and Buffett kept on with it. So basically, he had an understanding of that business. Because I think that it's consumer behavior. Yeah. and. So Buffett's understanding of consumer behavior is very strong. So I think he was able to kind of get there on that front. But yeah, I mean, Charlie's, I think, contributions to Berkshire is huge. There's no Berkshire Hathaway without Charlie. But he would never say that. You know, he would never want to take credit for that or say that or any of those things. Yeah, so I was going through your book, The Dundu Investor, and you mentioned two, three formulas to value a business. But I'm sure that is a bit of the entire picture. So do you have a particular do you have a particular like framework or something on how to value the business? You were, did you bring up the, like, the Kelly formula? No. Yeah, the Kelly formula and the John Burr Williams formula. The what? The John Burr Williams formula. Yeah, yeah. So actually, the if I were to do another edition of the Thando Investor, I would take out the Kelly formula. I think the inclusion of the Kelly formula is a mistake. So the Kelly formula really does not apply to investing, value investing the way we do it because we don't get the opportunity to make 1,000 bets. So for example, if heads is 51% and tails is 49% and you give me 10,000 coin tosses, Kelly formula is gonna tell you how much of your net worth you should bet on each coin toss for optimization, right? But in the stock market, we don't get that approach. We, I don't get to make the same bet with those odds, and I don't actually have as clear a view on those odds. John Burr Williams, I think that's just a definition of intrinsic value. So that is timeless, right? So it's this present value, all future cash that will come out of a business. So that, I think that is always going to be there the difficulty with that is that calculating, calculating the number is hard. For a lot of businesses, it's hard. So one of the shortcuts we like to take is that you know calculating the future, business, future returns and future cash flows can be hard. But if, for example, if a business is valued at you know a billion dollars 
and we know that next four or five years they'll make 500 million a year. We don't need to know more than that, right? We're, we're, we're okay. So basically, the way you can get around John Bird Williams is that you don't need to calculate it. It's just so obvious. Like in Resa's case, it's so obvious we don't need to calculate it. In the case of TAV airports, we don't need to calculate it. So, uh, in fact, I think there's a good argument to be made that which even Warren and Charlie talk about that they basically never run DCF. You know, Munger says that Buffett talks about all the DCFs, he's never seen him run one. And so, actually, the correct way to do things is to never run a DCF. And so, that's okay. And just one more question. Out of curiosity, you said that you went to Turkey and you talked to different businesses. So, what exactly do you talk about when you? Yeah, so what I'm, what I'm trying to do when I'm meeting a company for the first time is I'm trying to get a picture in my head of how that business works, right? So I've always, I mean, if we, if we have a Coke bottler, we know that they have to pay a royalty to Coke, and we know that they have CapEx expenses and all of that, but they have a very strong brand. So basically, if you can get the distribution, there's a pull, the market will pull it. And so, and we have a lot of models around the world which tell us what kind of returns those businesses generate. So I basically, I'm always, always asking companies how the business works, what the business is all about, how it makes money. And what I'm trying to figure out in my head is, is it something that's easy for me to understand? And so my questions are along the lines of just trying to get a <coughs> understanding of how the business works. You know what? What makes it tick? Let me see if we can get the last person, someone who hasn't asked. Yeah, please. Yeah, actually, <clears throat> my question was related to something which you were just mentioning. When okay. William Green's book came out, you uh, mentioned that you were inspired by what Nick Sleep mentioned in, in the interview about the flywheel effect, and you also wanted to kind of change your uh, investment journey according to that. But it seems like. That's still a work in progress. So. Well, I mean, I think I think the one big learning that I got from Nick Sleep is that when you identify and have ownership of a great business, partial ownership of a great business, you're done. Pretty much, you don't need to do anything beyond that, right? And if you look at Nick Sleep's portfolio, there are a lot of mistakes. But the mistakes really don't matter because the fact that he invested in Amazon dwarfs everything, right? So it doesn't matter what the rest of the portfolio does. That's the nature of investing. I mean, you could make a 5% bet on a company, and you could be wrong on the other 95% of your portfolio, and the 5% could become a 100 bagger, and the rest won't matter, right? So that's the, the, the symmetric nature of investing makes that possible. And so that's why I think that if you own an overvalued business, which is a great business, but appears overvalued, you should give it a lot of room. You know, which like, for example, when I sold Ferrari, etc. So I don't, I, I actually don't have a problem anymore with holding a great business at a high valuation. I have made some progress. No problem with that. The problem I have is paying up for a great business. So I have to be able, for Monish, the business has to come in cheap. And after that, we are OK. But a lot of great investors are able to, like for example, you know, I, I talked to Charlie about Costco, right? So I said, Charlie, you, know, you are so madly in love with Costco. Should I buy Costco? So he said, he said, if you were running a pension fund with a you know, 40, 50 year life, it is not a bad holding 3, 4, 5% of the portfolio. But for you, Monish, no. You don't need to buy Costco. Right? And because it's, it's, a, it's a fully priced or even overpriced position. And so we actually, the investing business is very forgiving. Even though I have all these imperfections, it still works out. You know what I'm saying? We have so much suboptimal execution. Still works okay. 
and we still have things to learn, which makes it fun. So we'll keep learning and moving along. Take it from there. So Durgesh, I should we move? Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much.